An update from inside the Uber Waymo trial. Secret iOS code shows up on GitHub. John Battelle on John Perry Barlow. And more bad news about breaches. All that coming up on Tech News Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 18, recorded Thursday, February 8th, 2018. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life, and that's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash twit. Welcome to Tech News Weekly. This is a show where we talk to the people making and breaking the tech news. I am Megan Maroney. And I'm Jason Howell. Week four of six. Four of six, Megan. Mm -hmm. He's talking about switching our phones. I tried to get out of it because <laughs> I have a HomePod arriving tomorrow. Oh. And I want to that I have HomePod arriving tomorrow now, right? That's no. how it works. I'll oh. set it up with my iPad or my old iPhone 6. Fine. I'll do what I have to do. Yeah. To I won't survive. be setting it up with this Android phone, though. Okay. All right. The Waymo versus Uber trial, trade secrets trial, is in full swing this week. And joining us to discuss the highs and lows of the case is Kia Coca Cheleva. Coca Lecheva. Coca Lecheva, who has been in the courtroom covering the trial for Axios. Thank you for joining us, Kia. Thank you for having me. So you write that the trial started off on Monday with an opening statement claiming that former Uber CEO Travis Kalanick wanted to win the self-driving car race at all costs. Now, what exactly is Waymo trying to convince uh, the, the jury that Uber and Kalanick actually did? So they actually have to ex uh, prove like a set of things. So first they need to prove that um, Anthony Lewandowski who used to be a Waymo um, executive. So they need to show that he stole a bunch of files or IP trade secrets in some kind of a form. And then that he took those into Uber. And there's a whole like narrative about Uber scheming with him to do that. But then he need, they need to show that he actually took them inside of Uber. And then they need to show um, that Uber actually used the trade secrets and their own technology to get ahead, which is the at all costs part. Um, with that said, it, th there's kind of a couple of scenarios. Um, they could get an injunction against Uber if they show that Uber took the trade secrets and so it would just bar them from being able to use them. But if they did in fact use them and kind of enrich their business by using the trade secrets, then they could probably get some damages for that. So uh, in the trial this week, in the courtroom, are you learning all of the trade secrets? So that's the interesting part. We're actually not allowed to see the trade secrets. Um, they're, they've been uh, sealing off the courtroom for certain parts of the testimony. They've been kept confidential in the court filings throughout the year. Um, so that's like the one thing that the public won't get to see. We don't know what these trade secrets really are. Um, so they just kind of refer to them nebulously. And we know it's about sensors. Mm. So uh, I know there's a lot of uh, talking about their relationship uh, before. And when Kalanick took the stand, it was he talked about um, how the Google, the people at Google, now Waymo, um, the self-driving car part, uh, that it was like their big, big brother. He was a little brother and they were the big brother. What went wrong in their relationship? Have you learned that? Uh, yeah, well, so to um, hear it told by Travis, obviously that's his version of the events. Um, there's a couple of things that happen. On one hand, um, you know, Travis always thought that he would work on, or Uber would work on ride sharing or ride hailing, and Google would focus on self driving cars. And obviously, it's a natural uh, complement, and eventually they could work together to put these things together. 
And he, according to him, kind of got frustrated because Larry Page, the CEO of Alphabet, which is the uh, parent company of Waymo, just kept blowing off meeting with him and talking about it. And then they, Uber started to hear a bunch of rumors, which were also substantiated that um, Google and Waymo wanted to get into ride sharing. So that was one side of the, wait, you're getting into our turf. And then they got into the self-driving, uh, Uber got into the self-driving car arena and then Waymo got upset about that. And so you could see how the relationship did not go well after that. At this point um, in the testimony, has has uh, Kalanick gotten into, dove into it all, his thoughts or opinions around former Waymo and Uber employee, both of them basically, Anthony Lewandowski, has he really kind of dove into what he thought he was getting and how he wanted to set out that relationship with Anthony Lewandowski coming over? So he... Uh, he only got asked a couple of questions about it. Um, so he didn't really, you know, spend a lot of time, but he was asked, um, you know, what, what did he think of Anthony originally and he, and why they hired him. And he said, you know, we thought he was a brilliant technologist and he was, you know, ambitious and all of these things. And even said he was charming. Um, and so that's why they hired him. And he was pretty clear that they didn't hire him to steal trade secrets. They just viewed him as this, you know, great asset to the company, you know, just by being a great engineer and visionary. Um, and then shortly after that on the stand, he also said that clearly that didn't work out very well. So, so, so um, largely it sounds like Lewandowski is become, I mean, it, it largely being seen at least early on as the, the total fall guy here where it's like, yeah, well, any of these problems that we're in, you can probably blame that guy. It kind of sounds like that. Well, so one of the things that I think all parties agreed to pretty quickly when the lawsuit got underway was that Lewandowski did some stuff that probably he shouldn't have done. You know, there, there's the file downloads. There's, if you look at some of the way he talks in text messages um, and emails, like clearly, like most likely this guy does some stuff he shouldn't have been doing. Um, now Uber is in the position of sh like trying to prove that, oh, well, so he did things, but you know, that's separate from us. We're not party to mischief. You know, that's his deal. So that's kind of the the place we're at right now. Right. And is Kalanick going back on the stand at all or is he done? He's done. And what about Lyft? Where do they fit in with all this? Um, a couple of places. One, they are Uber's main rival. And then they're also partnered with Waymo on self-driving car stuff. Um, they apparently made an offer to acquire the company that Anthony and his co-founder uh, founded and then eventually sold to Uber. Um, to be clear, there was never a formal term sheet that was sent over, but they talked about acquisition price and other terms. So it was serious enough. Um, but other than that, they're not really involved they're just sort of in the in the industry and have some relationships but that's kind of it hmm. and yeah you had said that uh Kalanick is is done in court but you know Kalanick, Kalanick's reputation in many ways precedes him right like he's al almost has a mythical character whether you've met him or not you've read a ton about him and you feel like you know the kind of person that he is and how he comes across how would you describe his demeanor in the courtroom um, kind of dealing with these topics. I mean, this is such an important case for him and for Uber. Uh, how did he come across on the stand? Um, he seemed to be taking it pretty seriously. Um, you know, he was answering all the questions, try, you know, trying to be really calm about it. Um, he all, you know, also seemed to be prepared, you know, like he, he was careful in his answers. Um, there was one part that I found was interesting is that he seemed pretty neutral or even a little, um, you know, sort of you could tell the, the gravity of what was happening throughout most of his testimony, except for the part where he was asked about 
you know, the birth of Uber and where the idea came from and what was the vision. And that was sort of one part in his testimony where you could see him light up and he was just, you know, the passionate Travis Kalanick CEO of Uber that we've all seen. And he talks about, you know, changing transportation and all of these things. And so that was kind of one little piece um, of his testimony where you, you saw a glimmer of the passionate CEO that we've right. all seen before. Right. So how long, do you have any idea how long the trial's going to last? It's um, on the calendar until the 23rd. Um, I don't think it's expected to go longer than that. Um, we're probably going to deal with uh, Uber's side next week. Um, so we should probably wrap it up within that time frame. Will, will Lewandowski be taking the stand uh, in this regard? I believe he is, although uh, he pleaded the fifth to a lot of things throughout the case. So um, he's expected to continue to plead the fifth on a lot of things. So I think his testimony is going to be um, pretty limited. Okay. Well, Kia, thank you so much for joining us. Kia Kokolacheva covers tech and VC for Axios. You can follow her coverage at axios.com slash technology. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. Thank you, Kia. So last week we had a question about the problem of infant and kid car seats in Lyft and Ubers. And Mattia, Mattia wrote in, Mattia wrote in about the question, said, a great question on the weekly news show about the needs for car seats. It shows another aspect of the myopic Silicon Valley view of the world, which normally doesn't include anyone over 30 or with kids. <laughs> no offense intended. I know you have kids. In this case, maybe there is an excuse if self-driving cars really do make the road safer, perhaps we would have less need for strapping our kids down in 15-point harnesses. Hmm, okay. I never thought about that. I think that's really interesting. I think keeping, um, especially when kids are older, keeping them in car seats is more of just a legality. Like it's not, it's not, you know, I've read like, studies about this. It's not, it's just people kind of covering their butts. It's not right. necessarily safer. Um, so yeah, I wonder, I mean, that's not going to change. People are still going to be scared of just generally fear of, yeah. of hurting our children being hurt in any way. I mean, I mean, if, if the roadway is always filled with some self-driving vehicles and mm -hmm. some human, you know, piloted vehicles, um, there's always the you know the possibility that something goes not according to plan. If mm -hmm. everything was self-driving and it was all locked into some sort of a connected grid, that sort of thing, then maybe I could I could trust it a little bit more. But uh, really hard to think. Oh, I think things are just a little bit safer, so I don't need to protect my kid. You yeah. know, <laughs> that would be a hard hard one for me to to. Uh, to accept. Back in my day, I yeah. used to sit on the floor in the back of the <laughs> station wagon. It's and I true. We have come fine. a long way when it comes to that sort of stuff. I remember that too uh, from back in my day. Uh, some interesting code appeared on GitHub in recent days. And by interesting, I mean potentially not very good for Apple. I'm talking about source code from iOS 9 that handles uh, the loading of iOS upon boot on iOS 9 devices. Uh, let's just say that Apple really doesn't want people to have this code, but there it is on GitHub. Joining us to talk about the severity of this leak is Lorenzo Franceschi Bicarai uh, from Motherboard. And it's great to have you back, Lorenzo. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Jason. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, you mentioned in your article that author Jonathan Levin calls this the biggest iPhone or Apple leak in history. Would you say that that's pretty appropriate given the context of how important this code is to the security, the underlying security of iPhones? Yeah, I think the important context here is that obviously, as we all know, Apple doesn't like leaks at all. Um, although we have to say that in the last few years, uh, they've been... Um, maybe intentionally or unintentionally, not as good as keeping leaks under control, especially with like, you know, new product releases and stuff. It seems like every year we, we sort of know what's coming, uh, whereas a few years ago they were able to surprise us. But that's like products and features. Uh, in this case, as you said, it's like code and uh, <clears throat> it's, it is source code. And it's source code from um, for a very sensitive and very uh, important part of iOS. And yeah, as you said, this is not code that it's meant to be on GitHub. Uh, <laughs> Apple would never put it there and they don't like it. 
uh, that it's there. Um, now, the company has come out today and said that this is not a huge deal because it's old code, which is true. It's from iOS 9, so uh, at least a couple of years old. Um, so, you know, for regular users, this is not um, a concern in the sense that, like, this is not going to make uh, your iPhone more insecure. It's not going to, I don't know, it's not going to make some Chinese hackers or whatever uh, break into your iPhone. But it is interesting and it does definitely help uh, uh, the community of jailbreakers and security researchers who uh, look into iOS. So is there is there any reason, uh, do we have any idea who did this? I mean, or why they did it? Was it just like maybe a kid just trying to, like, oh, I got my whole hands on this. I, I might as well put it out there. Yeah, it's hard to tell because uh, it's the story behind this is kind of unknown uh, still, and uh, uh, the traces that are online don't really tell us the full picture. Uh, basically, from what we know at this point, uh, someone posted this uh, originally on Reddit, on the jailbreak subreddit, and this was this was like October or November, so around four months ago, and the user was a completely new user, so presumably someone who just made like a, you know a throwaway account to post this, and um, that post didn't get almost any attention because since the post uh, the sorry the user was new, uh, they didn't have like karma or you know reputation <laughs> yeah. on the channel. And so they got the, the the post got basically not deleted, but essentially like made invisible, almost invisible unless you were looking for it. So it's unclear how many people actually saw that when that happened. I'm sure someone did, and you know if you searched on Google, I think that would have come up. Uh, so what appears to happen uh, to have happened is that uh, whoever it was posted that on Reddit for months ago, that somehow circulated in the underground, so to speak. And uh, and then yesterday someone was just like, you know what, I'm gonna put it on GitHub. But bef what, what happened before that Reddit post, right now it's totally unclear. And I mean, does Apple, like I'm, I'm trying to think about how, how, you know, this code that obviously should not be on GitHub and that Apple would not want on GitHub, what is Apple's recourse there? Is GitHub pretty uh, responsive in taking down source code like this or, or I mean, what, what can they do? What can Apple do? Yeah, it seems like it, uh, GitHub was actually pretty responsive and quick. Um, I think Apple sent a, a DMCA uh, takedown notice a few hours after the GitHub uh, link started circulating on Twitter. So this is like, um, I guess, last night. Um, and uh, GitHub responded within a few hours as well, taking down the initial repository uh, but you know th this is the internet these things once they get a lot of attention it's just you're just not gonna stop them with lawyers so there's a bunch of other github repositories that have just mirrored the code reposted it you know people have it on their computers so it's just a matter of creating an account and posting it um, Apple has been sending uh, at least another uh, takedown notice with a list of uh, I think uh, around a dozen other accounts that they want taken down and I presume that GitHub has responded to those as well and complied because you know after all this is uh, copyrighted code um, so yeah it's like you know Apple what, what Apple is doing is basically trying to stop the spread but it might be too late at this point and uh, you mentioned in the article that this is obviously code from iOS 9 how I mean, what is the potential overlap there? How, how could this be applied to some of the more modern, most modern iPhones, uh, or if at all? Yeah, Apple says that uh, in their statement, Apple basically said that um, even this this code being online doesn't really matter because it's been a while ago and there's new measures, uh, you know, both in terms of hardware and software, uh, both new security measures. So it's basically the, what they implied there was that this is so old that it doesn't really matter. And I think in part they're, they're right. Like, obviously, you know, they're from a PR standpoint, they're trying to downplay this because mm -hmm. It's an embarrassing incident uh, to lose this kind of code um, and get it on GitHub. Uh, but but they are probably honest and right when they say that you know this is not very dangerous uh, by itself. I'm curious uh, to know about kind of the jailbreak community because I mean you know code like this and uh, ways in you know kind of backdoors that sort of stuff. When it, whether you're talking about Android or iOS or whatever, that's the kind of thing that enables 
third parties to you know do things like over overwrite the the system OS with something that's more tailored, more customized on a third party sense. And Apple, as we know, is not very okay with that. Android's maybe a little bit more friendly with that sort of stuff. Apple really tries to go the extra mile to prevent people from doing things like jailbreaking their iPhone. Is this the sort of thing that gives people the insight, the ability to then do that? Is this good for the jailbreak community at least? Yeah, definitely. I mean, they are the ones that are sort of celebrating this. Um, because as you said, like Apple really likes to tailor your experience and our experience. They don't want us to, I mean, if you remember the old iPhone, you know, the original ones and even the first ones, like you could not customize it in any way. Like I think the first one didn't even allow you to change the background, you know, the wallpaper. And obviously, you know, times have changed. There's a lot you can do now, but uh, it's still like the ethos is still like we're going to give you the best experience. We think it's best for you and you have to trust us. Uh, and the jailbreak community has always been about, well, we don't trust you or like we don't like your what you're giving us. And we want to we just want to do whatever we want. And um, and, you know, it's it's actually the history of the jailbreaking community and the jailbreaking movement is very interesting because they sort of pioneered uh, features that, that then ended up being part of iOS itself. Yeah. And and this is also this is in part because Apple itself uh, hired some of these uh, jailbreakers and sort of like um, you know ate up what their knowledge and their <clears throat> their what they were doing. Um, so yeah, so the, right now the jailbreak community, which is much smaller than it used to be, but they are looking into this code and trying to figure out if it's still relevant to iOS 10 or 11, um, and they're trying to see what they can do with it. Yeah, what well, they can extract, how they can uh, use it to make more devices jailbreakable, I guess. Uh, you also happen to write about Azimuth Security, which is a small security company out of Australia. Tell us a little bit about this company. It was a quite, a, quite a long article, a whole lot of detail here. I'm really curious to know how, what this company is, how they're doing business, what they're working toward. Tell us a little bit about Azimuth. Yeah, so yesterday my colleague Joseph Cox and I uh, wrote this story, as you said, and uh, the story, as you said, it's basically about this one company in Australia called Azimuth, which is relatively well known inside the cybersecurity or info, inf information security world, but it's pretty, well, it's pretty unknown outside of it. And even inside the cybersecurity community, they're not like super well known because they don't need to be and they don't want to be. And uh, and that's because what they do is essentially provide governments with um, highly uh, specialized services like hacking tools and uh, iOS exploits, for example, Android exploits uh, that then help governments basically go after the bad guys, you know, break into computers, uh, cell phones of, I don't know, you can imagine terrorists or criminals of some sort. Um, and yeah, the, the, in reality, Azimuth is just part of a niche, of a small niche, uh, a small industry. Like they're not the only ones doing this, but it's a very opaque industry. And so they have, you wrote that they have deals with the FBI. Like are they <coughs> presumably like the ones that might um, help in cases like the the um, the iPhone case last year where the, the San Bernardino, the San Bernardino uh, uh, killer tried to get into their phone. Is that what they would be doing? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, that would be a good example of something that they could provide. Um, you know, in that case, we still don't know who provided it. And there were rumors uh, about um, about it being Celebrite, uh, another company that's sort of similar to them, even though like Celebrite focuses more on uh, local hacks, meaning like uh, uh, hacks done to devices connected locally, whereas uh, Azimuth focuses more on uh, remote hacks over the internet. But you know, the idea is the same, trying to help police or intelligence agencies break into highly secure devices. Hmm. What, what would you say this discovery, kind of knowing all of this about a company like this, I mean, it, it seems like this isn't the kind of insight that you generally have for companies like this, especially when they're working with, with the government uh, to the, do this sort of stuff. So based on this discovery, what does that tell you about zero the, this trade, the zero day exploit trade? Um, that we maybe didn't know for certain prior to this. Yeah, I think that this was, we thought that this story was important because even though, uh, you know, we didn't break the news on the zero day uh, industry, like this has been known for a while, uh, especially, you know, again, especially in the infosec world. But 
it's always been, you know, ever since the first stories started coming out of it, um, describing what this trade was and who, who was inside this trade. And we're talking about like early 2010s, uh, 2011 or 12. Those stories describe this industry as some sort of like very shady, sketchy, perhaps illegal corner of the industry, of the InfoSec world where um, I think someone described it even as like cyber merchants of death who would like give governments tools to hack into your iPhone or stuff like that. And we wanted to highlight that that's not really always true. You know, obviously there are some bad actors, just like there are bad actors in every industry. Um, but at the end of the day, these are like services that governments need because of the rise of encryption and the fact that, um, you know, consumer software like Chrome or iOS is incredibly secure. Um, so yeah, like there is there is a part of the industry that is legitimate and appears to be doing just, you know, good work and um, and dealing with like, yeah, basically the doing uh, important work. Yeah, yeah. And then you point out at the, near the end of the article that this kind of boutique, I don't know if boutique's the right word, but, you know, this small, small-ish company, small team, but working on these zero-day exploits, like this is only going to get harder and harder. This is going to be, at some point, it's going to be a business that's not very sustainable based on the amount of effort and the complications that go into actually finding and managing and distributing these zero days uh, to the people that are hiring them, right? Yeah, it's possible. I mean, you know, it's hard to, it's it's impossible to know what the future holds. But if we look at the the trend, that that's definitely a possibility. I, I don't remember the price list uh, going around a few years ago, but... Um, you know, like the prices of exploits have gone up and up, um, both in the sort of gray market, if you will, of like, you know, these companies like Azimuth, and also in the bug bounty markets. So Apple's own bug bounty gives out, gives out incredible amounts of money, you know, like $200,000. And um, and in the private market, like the gray, so-called gray market, those amounts are even higher. You know, we're talking about $1 million, $2 million. And and it's because it, and it's not because like I don't know it's not because people have money to throw away it's because uh, some of these hacks and exploits take really literally months uh, to develop and you need not just one person but maybe a team of two or three people and so you know that's a lot of time that's a lot of resources and it's a, lot, a big investment. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Lorenzo Franceschi, Biki or I, we really appreciate you taking time uh, out of your busy schedule to talk to us about these two stories. It was great having you on again, Lorenzo. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Always fun. To all right. Motherboard.vice.com to follow all of Lorenzo's work. And we'll talk to you soon then. Thanks. All right. Up next, uh, we talk a little bit about the legacy of John Perry Barlow. We're going to dive into uh, his, his importance to the internet, basically, and a whole lot more. But first... Uh, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage, by Quicken Loans. If you've ever gone through the process, you know what I'm talking about. The mortgage experience is not the easiest experience in the world, and that's partially because it hasn't kept up with the times. It hasn't stayed in the, the digital now. It's become really complicated finding all this information, collecting it, managing it. Uh, hey, the internet's there. We needed a client-focused technological revolution that relies on the ease of use of the internet. And that's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. Rocket Mortgage actually gives you the confidence that you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. It's simple. It allows you to fully understand all the details and be totally confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. It's also convenient. Their trusted partners allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button. It's very powerful. Whether you're looking to buy your first home or maybe it's your 10th and hey, if you've got 10 homes, hey, congratulations to you. Uh, Rocket Mortgage is able to perform thousands of calculations in seconds to make all of that so much easier for you. It's based on your income, your assets, your credit. Rocket Mortgage can analyze all of the home loan options for which you qualify and then find the one that's just right for you. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidently. To get started, all you have to do is go to rocketmortgage.com slash twit. That's rocketmortgage.com slash twit. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states. NMLS consumer access .org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support of Tech News Weekly.
So news broke yesterday that John Perry Barlow, founder of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the Freedom of the Press Foundation, as well as former longtime lyricist for the Grateful Dead, among many other things, uh, he, news broke yesterday that he passed away on Tuesday the age of 70. And joining us to talk about his legacy and importance to the internet as we know it today is John Battelle. John is the founder of Wired, Industry Standard, Federated Media, and Writer, and again, a bunch of other things. Welcome to the show, John. It's great to have you here. Thanks for having me. It's awesome having you here. So you wrote about your connection to Barlow, which began as his editor at Wired back in the 90s. What, what can you tell us about your earliest interactions with him and how that kind of developed over time? Well, I mean, Barlow was kind of an overwhelming, you know, human being. Um, he was kind of everything you wanted to be, um, you know, if you were an aspiring creative person. Um, and I was a very, I was this kind of the young guy at Wired. And um, uh, I met him through uh, my co-founders, Kevin Kelly and Louis Rossetto. Uh, and, and he was just bigger than life, um, wore cowboy boots. You know, had a lot of hair, um, and he was Republican, which was just the weirdest thing. But he he loved um, music, obviously, and I was a huge Dead fan, and so to, I felt like I was in royalty just being in his presence. Um, and then, uh, you know, as we started putting together the first issue of the magazine, um, somehow we convinced him to start writing for us, and that then I got to engage with his mind, you know, in, a, in sort of a deep way, in that way you only can when you kind of tear apart copy and put it back together again. Um, and uh, and that was both challenging and incredibly satisfying at the same time. Yeah, we were reading through, uh, prior to the show, an, an article from 93, February 93, called Jack In, from yeah, John Perry Barlow. So I'm sure, I'm sure you're familiar with that, but it's well. That was like one of the first pieces that he did that where he became kind of what he's well known for in the internet world, uh, sort of a proselytizer, an evangelist for uh, you know for the liberties of cyberspace. Right. So I mean, what I I I'm just wonder what you think he might have thought about the internet right now. Like what, you know, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes and, and just the tech lash as many people are calling it because, you know, his manifesto was so inspiring, but there were so many things that didn't uh, happen that he, uh, that he <laughs> hoped for in the, uh, in the internet. Well, I think he and I share that frustration. Um, certainly the last few times I spoke with him, we, t we talked about it. Um, and the last time I spoke with him was a couple of years ago. And, you know, I, already by that point, it was pretty clear that, you know, Facebook and Google had won um, and that the open web was in uh, retreat uh, and seriously uh, endangered. But I think there's a sense of optimism that I still share uh, and that he embodied that, you know, you can't really ever kill the potential of the internet. Um, it's just impossible. Uh, and, and there's a sense that it's always going to be there and always there when we need it. And I have a feeling that that, uh, truth is going to be a very important one as we, you know, go through the, you know, very difficult issues we're struggling with now as a society, as it relates to the externalities of our current, you know, instantiation of the internet. Yeah. And realizing just that the, the power of what we've created. <laughs> I'm right. if we can put that genie back right. in the bottle a little bit. Yeah. Um, but before we kind of dive further into that, I wanted to ask you a little bit as far as uh, the Barlow friends, which makes up a, a large part of of what you wrote about about Barlow. Right. Tell us a little bit about that. How did how did that come to be? How did how did you get added to this list? And uh, well, yeah, what did you learn about him through that? That's the best part. I have no idea how I got added to the list. I think it was. <laughs> You know, I think it's because, you know, I mean, I, he's had my email since 1992, yeah. um, since we did most of our work, you know, via phone and email. Uh, and at some point when, uh, you know, I don't know if it was the beginning of the list uh, or somewhere in the middle of it, but somewhere in the 90s, he added me to it. Um, and I just got a message in my inbox with this sort of very elaborate for the time formatting, you know, uh, all he had was ASCII, you know, um, uh, to, to format it, but he made all these pictures and had all this cool stuff. And, um, uh, and it just had this very remarkable, very raw, but, but the, you know, voice with these pearls that were in the middle of it, you know, almost like, you know, uh, couplets of poetry. Um, and I always loved getting them many times. It was just a call to a party, 
He just wanted people to show up wherever he was and throw a party uh, for free, basically, um, you know, because he was in town, of course. Um, and <laughs> uh, and it turned out that that's exactly what everyone wanted. Everyone wanted Barlow in town and everyone wanted to go to a party where Barlow was kind of the guest of honor. And so it just happened everywhere he went. And he, he rarely was in one place very long. He seemed to travel more than he ever settled down. Uh, but Barlow's Friends was a way for him to occasionally rant about things that were on his mind, particularly politics, um, and also uh, just keep a wide, you know, far-flung community together. Uh, you know, and it, it 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 died down over the last five or six years, uh, unfortunately. But he did move it to Facebook for a while, ironically, um, and uh, and then the last missive came uh, just this morning, uh, announcing his death. <laughs> So I know you said that he was a Republican, uh, which meant something different in the 90s. I always thought of him as a libertarian. Like, did he did he remain a Republican throughout the years or did his political leanings change or was it something completely different? Than yeah, he he um, he pretty actively uh, uh, abandoned the formal Republican Party with the Bush administration, the second Bush administration. Um, and, uh, from that point forward, I don't think he identified with a particular party. I think he used to say he was independent with a small eye, but, um, he certainly had libertarian political leanings. Um, uh, but he was more of a humanitarian. Um, he had a list which, uh, Kevin Kelly published on Boing Boing today of rules to live by if you want to be an adult. Um, and, and they were, you know, they were just so beautiful. I would uh, encourage anyone to go look at Boing Boing and check it out. Um, but I, I never really thought of him as a party person, as a you know political party person, as more than he was just deeply concerned with what was fair and what was right, uh, and how to comport yourself to ensure that that you know those values were upheld. Well, definitely related to to kind of the core of of Barlow's legacy is just the internet as it was versus where it is and what it's becoming very yeah. different 20 years ago compared to where we are right now. You also wrote about something that you called the tech lash where people are increasingly questioning the power and the influence of technology in our lives. It seems like every day we're hearing more and more about this. Talk a bit about the truth about tech campaign uh, and why this moment in time inspired such a, a campaign such as this. Yeah, this has been building for years. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, and in, uh, I write a set of predictions every uh, year in January and, and a year ago, a year and a month ago, I predicted that 2017 would be the year of the tech backlash. And I think that happened, but it broke out, I think, in a very, uh, you know, real way, in a public way with the formation of, uh, of this new organization, the Center for Humane Technology. And a lot of the people involved with it are people that uh, were, uh, you know, deeply involved in companies like Facebook and Google and feel like those companies have created, as I mentioned before, externalities that they have not gotten their arms around, nor have we as a society gotten our arms around. Um, and, I, and I think this is, a, a you know, an element of, uh, you know, lots of different forces coming together at the same time. You've got uh, kind of unbridled capitalism. Uh, the five largest companies uh, in the United States by market cap are technology companies, and they have extraordinary amount of power and cash and things like that. Um, but they also have intersected with our society in a way that I don't think we anticipated how important our information diet is to our politics, for example, uh, or how important um, our socialization is, our children's socialization is, once it becomes digitized and connected by the power of technology. Uh, and so we have a first generation growing up with this kind of power, truly deeply connected, high bandwidth power uh, in the form of Instagram or, 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 or Snapchat. And a generation of parents are, are realizing this power and they don't know what to do about it. So there's a lot of energy behind this, both on the political side with all the Russia, Facebook, Twitter hacking stuff, as well as socially in terms of uh, fear of how we're uh, bringing our children up and, and, and whether or not we truly understand how they're interacting with this tech. Mm -hmm. 
I spoke to Max Stossel, uh, who's part of this movement, part of, I guess, this, the, the Time Well Spent movement, which I guess right. they just changed their, their name. Um, and you, he focused really, when I talked to him about the attention economy and how with all this data, attention becomes a scarce resource and all these companies are fighting for as much attention as they can get of ours or our children's. And so in order to change, we're gonna have to change that dynamic and make sure that these big companies like Facebook and Google, the bottom line is not dependent on our attention. And I just, for the life of me, have no idea how that could possibly happen. Like, what do you think about that? Well, I think, you know, uh, big changes happen slowly and then all at once. Um, and so that's kind of what just happened to us. Uh, we woke up and realized we're living in a Facebook world and we're living in an attention economy. And it takes a while for a, a bit like that to flip, right? Um, but I think the way it happens is, is that consumers find a reason uh, to take control of our data, uh, a reason to uh, realize that perhaps our data isn't just capital to be used by uh, platform companies, but in fact is capital that we can uh, control and decide how it gets used. Um, and, and when that happens, I think the model will shift and we'll be more than happy to give that data away if there's value in the advertising economy coming back to us because of that data. Um, but that model doesn't exist at the moment. The, the, the data is held and, and, and the value exchange created by the platforms and not by the people. Um, and so we have a structure that I think will evolve over time. Uh, and one of the great things about capitalism is competitive markets. Um, and I do expect to see, uh, you know, some young uh, startups beginning to break out who have models that, that, that feel a little bit more humane. And I think one of the reasons the Center for Humane Technology exists is to explore and support those kinds of models. Yeah, Beatree in the chat room has a really good point. You know, what if we've already given it away? That's the challenge of where we're at right now is with technology is that we've spent so many years giving so much of us in a digital sense for these things that we get in return and then you end up in this moment of this tech lash where people start realizing hey wait a minute i i didn't know what i was doing i didn't realize it but hey <laughs> it happens to be too late right you already gave all of that information which kind of makes it a little defeating is it is it regulation that is the the solution to these problems or well, can we trust these companies to self regulate in that regard let's let's just say historically um, regulation has been how we've managed uh, a fair number of similar cases that doesn't mean it's necessarily the right way to go forward right, right. but the threat of it is real you know i mean we've seen it with uh, standard oil at&t even microsoft in the 90s um the threat of regulation with microsoft forced uh you know a uh settlement which changed microsoft's core culture pretty significantly um facebook google and others are, are extremely aware of all of this um and you see them already you know uh, uh spending a lot of time and energy figuring out how to move forward. I mean, fixing Facebook is Mark Zuckerberg's number one priority for the year, according to his New Year's resolution. Um, so I'm not sure how one person or one company can fix something that is, frankly, a much larger issue than one person or one company. Yeah. But it's good that they're paying attention. And what do you make of this movement being led by people who uh, created these tools in the first place? Um, Roger McNamee um, from Facebook and uh, Tristan Harris, who uh, came from Google. What, what, they're coming from the inside. Do you think, I mean, is, is there a histor historical precedence for that? I mean, what do you make of that part of this? Um, well, I think it lends a certain amount of credibility to the effort, first of all. Uh, it also makes it seem a bit more urgent that the people who know the most are the people who are a bit, you know, uh, concerned or very concerned about about this issue. Um, I think that's one of the reasons that it's gained as much traction as it has, is that these are not just outside carpers. These are people who help build these tools. Um, and sure, a lot of them made fortunes and sure, a lot of them, you know, you could call hypocrisy on the whole lot of them. But the fact is, is we all learn um, and we all, uh, you know, uh, can do better. So I think it's great that the people from the inside are involved, and I hope more people join. Absolutely. And finally, John, tell us a little bit about uh, Shift Forum. We've got a bunch of really great speakers happening there. What What is Shift Forum, and who can people uh, look forward to seeing there? Well, actually, the purpose of Shift Forum is to have a conversation about the role of business in society, and specifically the role of business in society in a world that's driven by technology, um, and to ask the question, 
what is the proper you know function and purpose of business um, which is our most robust and agile and iterative social organization um, and I think we are all asking you know what can companies do and what should companies do given the power that they have you know not just citizens united in terms of being human and having free speech but also in terms of you know being you know socially responsible uh, structures in our society. So the people that are coming are politicians like Eric Garcetti, uh, uh, who is uh, mayor of Los Angeles, uh, Chris Christie, the former governor of New Jersey, um, John Hickenlooper, the Colorado governor. Uh, many of these people are, will be running for president or considering running for president ne- uh, in in 2020. But also, you know, people like Reid Hoffman, the founder of uh, LinkedIn, now on the board of Microsoft, or Ben Silberman, who runs Pinterest, so tech leaders. And then, of course, leaders like uh, Kevin Johnson, the CEO of Starbucks. So you bring together leaders from tech, leaders from big business, leaders from small upstart companies and politicians. And the idea is let's talk about what the role of business is in our society and should and can we expect more from them. So I anyway, you started NUCO in 2014 or 2015. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so four years ago. And mm-hmm. um, does and, and this was part, was this part always part of the mission or has it evolved yeah. over time? So so it is part of you just saying, well, finally, you guys are figuring this out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the party. Well, yeah, I guess there is. A, there, I do have this problem ever since Wired of paying attention to stuff that ends up being pertinent in four or five years from the point. I'm sure it's a big deal. Um, it's like one of these, you know, uh, but uh, it's nice that the moment's starting to happen where business is seen as, as a, as an important and critical actor in, in, in understanding how we can heal our social, uh, you know, divisions. Um, but that was the purpose of Nuco was to identify new kinds of companies that were, you know, doing well by doing good. Um, and, uh, that had a purpose and a mission driving them as opposed to just a mercenary goal of extracting capital for shareholder pockets. Um, and I think since that, you know, four or five years ago when we started it, we see the leader of Unilever or the leader of Starbucks or PepsiCo actually, you know, signing on to that kind of philosophy. So our goal is to just to identify those companies and celebrate them uh, and then convene conversations about this important narrative. Well, I guess you have a pretty good track record, so we can believe you that it, things can change. I certainly <laughs> hope so. <laughs> I think we all do. John Patel, it's uh, been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much for joining us. Of uh, Nuco.co for people that want to check in uh, on the Shift Forum and everything else that you're doing there. Is there anywhere else that you want us to point people to Nuco. follow you online? That's it. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> right on. John Patel, thank you again. We really appreciate it. Take care. All right. Thank you for having right. me. Take care. This week, we learned that a marketing firm called Octoly revealed sensitive personal information, including home addresses and real names for those who go by pseudonyms from over 12,000 YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter personalities. Joining us to talk about this breach is Chris Vickery from UpGuard, the security research firm that discovered this leak. Welcome to the show, Chris. Hey, how are you doing? Good. Thanks so much for coming on. First, tell us uh, what what Octoly is, what this company is. Well, Octoly... uh from best of my knowledge, is a kind of an influence marketing agency where they will hook up uh, people that have lots of followers with brands that are interested in those people talking about their brands. And uh, the brands will send out uh, promotional uh, goods, makeup, things of that nature to the influencers and with the hopes that the influencer will like it and review it in front of their potential millions of followers and uh, put in a good word for the brand. So it's like people that like my 14 year old daughter will follow on YouTube um, to give her ways to make a smoky eye. And then so they're getting all of that. They'll say like, oh, I love this Laurel, whatever mascara. And they're are they getting paid or are they just getting the product? Well, I don't work for Octoly. I don't know the ins and outs of exactly how uh, the system works. So I I don't think I should weigh in on whether or not any uh, actual cash changes hands. But uh, it's apparent from their material that a product does. And so what you did find out about them is that they their system was not secure. And they were revealing a lot of personal information of these clients of theirs. Well, the specific problem was that they had a uh, file repository up in the cloud, 
and there was no username or password uh, necessary to <laughs> see all the files and download files and view the contents of the files. Have you heard from any of these influencers who were <laughs> who were affected, <laughs> who, who realize now that maybe things weren't on the up and up? At, uh, None this? of them have uh, specifically reached out to me. Uh, yeah. Just watching the uh, chatter over places like Twitter and such, I've, I've seen a few of them uh, voice concerns about uh, the whole situation, though. And so you reached out to Octoly before you posted your story on UpGuard about the insecurity, right? Absolutely. <laughs> we we are very careful about uh, reaching out to companies that uh, are exposing data that probably shouldn't be exposed and uh, giving them the heads up and making sure that it's secured before we ever uh, mention anything publicly about a situation. And is there, was there, what was their response? Well, at first it was a little difficult to get a response out of them. Uh, then eventually uh, their co-founder sent an email uh, in response and uh, it took a few weeks for it to all get kind of settled out and and ultimately secured but uh basically email exchanges was uh the the response that we got to eventually and is that pretty normal when you contact people and say hey i can see all your stuff <laughs> the majority of the cases it gets secured within hours or within a day uh because people realize the severity of issues like this i was a little surprised at how long it took to get this one ultimately locked down yeah and i mean in the case of of something like this like there's really nothing that the people who who were vulnerable in this instance there's nothing that they had the capability of protecting themselves right this is purely on the hand uh of the company that, that was just irresponsible on their end how, I mean, I, I guess it's, it's the eternal challenge of right now, which is that stuff like this seems to be happening all the time, yet you feel so helpless. At the same time, our currency is all of our information, and it feels necessary to to put our information in all of these different places. How how do they know one way or the other whether they're dealing with a responsible company like this ahead of time to try and protect themselves? It's very difficult to know exactly who or which company is going to, uh, you know, be involved in a, a data security incident or may or may not be protecting the data that you provided them as well as they could be. Yeah. Uh, what I normally tell people is that the best uh, bang for your buck as far as protecting yourself is when these incidents happen. Make sure people are aware of it. Don't let it just slip under the rug and go away into darkness. Things like the Equifax breach. People made a lot of noise about that and let their representatives know that they were not happy with it. And that's really the only way it's going to change in the end is people raising awareness, uh, perhaps some new regulation going into place that makes businesses uh, afraid of the bottom line impact of having data breach uh, and security incidents occur. That as soon as it's not profitable to be not secure, companies will stop being not secure. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I mean, the, the, you know, there's a data breach every day. The, the thing that caught my eye in this case is this was mostly women. And it was a women who um, are followed in certain ways, which can be dangerous from a stalking perspective. And some of them had pseudonyms. Some of them put their trust in this company, um, you know, and they revealed their home address sometimes. Um, and, and so if you're going to do that, you really should make sure that the company companies, you know, uh, trustworthy. Yeah, but I mean, uh, a model or somebody who reviews makeup and uh, for, for a living, they, I don't know if they have the, the technical chops usually to dig in and say, okay, that company is really secure. I can trust them with my data yeah. and, uh, you know, and, and, and operate in that manner. It's, it's just not within a uh, reasonability. So, I, I don't really know what the final solution is going to be, but uh, definitely more regulation that makes companies uh, afraid of operating in a non-secure manner. Yeah. So you're the director of cyber risk research. Does that mean that you, I mean, are you sitting at your computer kind of poking to, around to find holes in people's security or is that someone else's job at this point? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do a lot of looking. I, I wouldn't necessarily call it poking because uh, I, I don't 
penetrate anything. Mm. I simply find data that is exposed to the public uh, open internet that anybody in the entire world could could access and download. Uh, as far as exploits and actual hacking goes, I don't I don't venture into those realms. But uh, I I do research. Uh, practical problems that companies run into and i do uncover a, a large amount of these data breaches uh personally so yes i am sitting at my computer uh looking around quite quite a bit every day so you guys discovered another breach a breach every day um this time it was from an insurance company what can you tell us about this story I believe the one you're referring to is the one that uh, broke late yesterday. Uh, mm -hmm. It involved a company in uh, Maryland that uh, offers property insurance. Uh, I believe they initially came into existence due to a government mandate many years ago uh, that basically said uh, people that need insurance but can't get it from regular insurance companies need an alternative so we're going to make this you know bottom level minimum standard uh the maryland joint insurance association these days from what i read isn't is not a uh, government related entity they're a, a private business but yeah uh there was a network attached storage device that was completely exposed to the public internet. You could go to it uh, through a web browser and download all of these backed up files. And it was uh, pretty eye opening. That was shocking because, like, that's a NAS. That's what I think of, like, John, our head engineer. That's where he keeps all of his Stargate episodes and other videos. Like, <laughs> it's not where you would expect, like, someone to be keeping, like, forms, your, your social security number, all this stuff. Is this common? It's more common than you realize. It's uh, something that I come across quite often, not always to this degree, but uh, the number of exposed NAS devices out there is uh, quite alarming. I feel like we should just give up. And Chris, I need, some, <laughs> I, I need some good news. Do you have any good news? Good news? Hey, there's companies like UpGuard that are watching out for this. Okay. <laughs> there are okay. good guys out there. <laughs> nice segue. Uh, and I hear that you are right around the corner from us. So next time when you come, you have to come into the studio and I need, uh, to come talk to us more about this and tell us the good news. And um, and sorry to uh, assume that you were poking around. Not. Um, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it comes with the territory. Chris Vicker Vickery is the Director of Cyber Risk Research at UpGuard. He can be found with all of his other people who do some more of the poking at upguard.com. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Take we'll care. talk to you soon. All right. Finally, if you like Megan and you love Snapchat for the filters, mm -hmm. then you'll probably like this bit of news. The service is rolling out a new feature for the web and iOS users to allow them to create their own customized face lenses and text caption styles for events. So, Starting at nine dollars ninety nine cents, depending on you know the size of the location, the the actual face lenses that would appear for how long, duration, all that kind of stuff, uh, and the pricing goes up from there. You can select from one hundred fifty lens templates to create your own unique face lenses to accompany a special events, uh, and you might this might sound a little familiar. Last ju uh, June, it was that Snapchat rolled out custom geo filters, so it's kind of the same thing, but this time. Uh, with your face. Yeah, I'm not, I'm already paying Snapchat with my face every day. <laughs> I don't know what kind of data they're getting from it, but they yes. have all of it. And um, so they're not getting any more of my money. Okay. All right. But I, but this seems to be more geared for like an event, like mm -hmm. you're having a wedding mm -hmm. or somebody's ha you know having a big party and within a certain block radius, anybody that's at your party can, when they open up Snapchat, can have access to this special face filter and make everyone jealous because they were there. Right. And so it's, it's obvious that they were there because it's on their Snapchat feed. Yeah. So it's like the, the modern day hashtag. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, that ancient archaic hashtag right. thing. It is so, so, yeah. Yeah, it's passe. so 2018 to have a wedding hashtag. Now it's... Um now it's or, face filter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Custom face filter. Uh, not on Android yet, by the way, I should mm. point out. So you can't use it on your Pixel 2 XL I already yet, told you I wasn't going to use it. Well, <laughs> but if it was on Android, you might. Yeah. You, are, you definitely aren't right mm -hmm. now because you can't. Mm -hmm. 
So um, but I, I, I will say that the face filters are amazing because, like, they there was one that um, it was an ad for whoever the guy is, the Old Spice guy, uh -huh. and like he was in your brain, and it's like. <laughs> uh, I definitely, do, I don't really try to, I try not to use the advertising filters, but it, it's really good advertising. But when it's cleverly done, mm -hmm. right? It, and that's the beauty of a really great advertisement, be it in this, you know, platform or anywhere else. The best, pla the best advertisements are so well done, so good that you almost forgive it for it being an advertisement because it's that good. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's, that's just how it goes viral, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Tech News Weekly records live every Thursday starting at 2.30 p.m. Pacific. We talk to lots of really just awesome people with great stories and all this kind of stuff. And you can watch uh, anytime you like. You can watch it live or in podcasts. Uh, if you want to go to twit.tv slash live at 2.30 p.m. Pacific on Thursdays, you can catch it live or course uh you know find it in your podcast feed later and if you want to be part of the conversation you can always do that too tnw at twit.tv and we should also mention that the twit flash briefing is now available in canada australia that's the right. uk and india so that's if you have an amazon echo you can just ask it to play play your flash briefing and every day we do a different one ours i believe is that is right tomorrow friday so you get to listen to us on friday you get to listen to all little bits of all the different shows so yeah. uh and if you want to listen to the whole show de definitely subscribe to that and if you want to tweet at me i am at megan maroney and i'm at jason howell thanks to everyone who helped today burke colleen jammer b josh i'm sure there were others i think patrick i saw walk across the the door out there alex um, moved to camera alex moved to camera he told padre, me to move over. padre sat in a noisy chair over there mm -hmm. everybody was helping victor uh, Victor is helping. Yeah, basically Someone's everybody that works here helps. I'm going to say show. Victor because I didn't say Victor last week. <laughs> and Kevin because he likes sharks. And thanks to you uh, for joining us today. We'll see you next week on another episode of Tech News Weekly. Take care, everyone.